BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Kate Bush, running up the charts across the world with a song first released in 1985, thanks to its appearance in hit TV series Stranger Things. Just seeing young people lit up by this music from a totally different era is amazing. I think it's brilliant that she is being discovered for the first time in many ways in America. We need artists like Kate Bush more than ever in the world today. Whether you're discovering her for the first time, been a fan since before these newcomers were born, or hadn't heard of her till 30 seconds ago, let us take you into the strange world of Kate Bush. The Kate Bush phenomenon started back in 1978. Punk had been around a couple of years, so a new wave was in full effect. But there was still Saturday Night Fever was flying out there. That was huge. Disco was huge. Progressive rock and Pink Floyd ELP. And in the middle of all this, along comes this teenager who is singing this very strange song in a very high voice and dancing, and it's very theatrical. And now making her debut on Top of the Pops is the exquisite Kate Bush with her new single, Wuthering Heights. The song is just so good and she is so arresting that it's no surprise that it became a hit. Music journalist Jude Rogers. It was on the radio and we were all together listening to it and we were going, this is Catherine, this is Catherine Bush. And especially amazing for Connie Nolan because she was at school with Kate, sorry, Catherine Bush, at St Joseph's Convent Grammar School, a private Roman Catholic school in Bexley, South East London. Kate was the youngest of the family. They lived in a farmhouse in Welling, kind of near South East London. So they obviously had the financial stability to have a decent life, but also had lots of music swirling around. Her father was a doctor, her mother was an Irish nurse, and... She had two older brothers, Paddy Bush and John Carter Bush, who were very involved in music and poetry. Author Graham Thompson wrote a biography of Kate Bush. Paddy made instruments, he was a multi-instrumentalist, very involved in folk music. It's called a uh, Astramento de Porco. That's its, its real name. You're Kate's brother, aren't you? Yeah, afraid so. Is it sort of a bit of a family business? Really? Kate and I have been making music together for years and years. At school, she sang and played, performed and wrote. I was dead jealous because I used to write my poetry and I thought it was brilliant. And I used to put it in for the school magazine and it never got in. But, you know, Catherine Bush, you know, she got stuff in all the time. She was prolific. She was well-liked, but... Kate was shy. Kate was reserved. You wouldn't think of her as being sort of a great star. As well as poems, young Kate was writing songs. A lot of songs. And recording them onto demo tapes. And this eventually made its way to Dave Gilmore of Pink Floyd, who instantly thought it had a lot of promise to it. I was intrigued by this strange voice. I went to her house met her parents down in Kent and she played me, God, I mean, it must have been 40 or 50 songs. And because he was obviously part of Pink Floyd and they were signed to EMI, he got those songs to the record company. The new demo of just three songs, produced with Gilmore's help, got Bush a contract with EMI. But as she was only 16, they put no pressure on her to deliver an album immediately. She spent the next couple of years getting 10 O-levels studying dance with Lindsay Kemp, who had also trained David Bowie, and performing folk music in local pubs. Finally, she was ready to record her first album at Woodwarf Studios in Greenwich. The Kick Inside was finished in late 1977. Now to decide what track to take as the first single. The record company wanted James and the Cold Gun to be the first single, and she was resistant, well, more than resistant. She was adamant that Wuthering Heights would be the first single, that somehow this would announce her to the world. And, you know, she fought that battle and she won. Wuthering Heights was released in January 1978 and went on to spend four weeks at number one. 
It was the first song, written and performed by a female artist, ever to hit the number one spot. Her voice, with its four-octave range, her experimental dance moves and her look all branded themselves on the imagination of a generation. The first time I met her, I think she was wearing very tight blue jeans and suede thigh boots, sort of buccaneers boots, and a sort of baggy, frilly shirt, rather theatrical. Photographer Gerard Bankovitz was brought in by EMI to create a more commercial look for the first album cover. And in four photography sessions, Kate and Gerrit came up with new images that would appear on album covers and posters, tour programmes and publicity material. Taking the theme of dance and movement, Gerrit brought in some dance wear for Kate to try on. And this was the origin of a photo that still haunts the dreams of a million men who were teenagers in 1978. She stepped out of the dressing room in that pink leotard and everybody was absolutely bowled over. She just looked fabulous. I knew that the leotard would be sexy, of course, but then Kate could put on a loose, baggy white shirt and be sexy. Kate Bush later said that she wasn't very happy about the way those images turned her into a pin-up. She worried her sex symbol status would distract from the music. There's a famous Pamela Stevenson sketch that sort of takes the mickey out of all that wide-eyed, hippy-dippy movement. Kate Bush is now seen as a kind of national treasure beyond criticism, but when she first emerged, she was mocked quite a lot. People would do comedy routines, you know, swirling around, you know, wearing dresses like her. Did she mind that, do you think? No, I don't think so. You you listen to interviews of hers from the time. She's very grounded. When Steve Coogan famously did a Kate Bush montage for Comic Relief, she was very pleased. (laughs) She was really happy about it. Jude Rogers again. Kate Bush was more than a musician now. She'd become part of the national culture. A second album was followed by live shows the tour of life. These performances went very far beyond playing live in the pubs of South East London. They incorporated so many things, dance, mime, poetry. It was more like a piece of experimental theatre. She used a head mic, which I think was the first time that was ever really used, that clip-on head mic, so she could fully use her physicality in the shows. The sound engineer invented it out of a wire coat hanger, especially for her. That's right, yes, exactly. And it's a, it's a great example of Kate Bush, kind of that the earthy and the, t- the technology um, combining in the same way. The tour was a critical and a commercial triumph, but it began with tragedy. After the warm-up show in Poole, lighting designer Bill Duffield fell from a great height and died. They nearly didn't do the tour, but they decided they would do it because that's what um, he would have wanted to do. But Kate Bush has never toured again. When asked, she has said it's because it takes too much time and energy away from writing and recording songs. In her next album, Never Forever, the song Blow Away is subtitled for Bill. It's a rare personal note between songs written from the perspectives of fictional characters, a suspicious wife, a bereaved mother and a child in the womb after a nuclear apocalypse. Music journalist Laura Barton thinks this imaginative ranging across perspectives is a distinctive feature of Kate Bush's work. I think from female singer-songwriters, we expect a certain level of sort of confessional singer-songwriting. We we expect soul-bearing. We expect something that sort of illuminates the private female world, and she never gives us that. She's always said these are not personal songs. Her fourth album, The Dreaming, was the first she produced by herself. And for the fifth, she built a studio where she could work exactly as she wanted. She brought in all kinds of musicians, including the bass player who made his name with the gothic rock band Killing Joke, Youth. Very idyllic. It was a sort of an outhouse sort of garage of a big family house that was a parent's house. And she... Set it up in a super pro way. What was lovely was that we we would start work early and, you know, her mother 
would come in at 11 o'clock with a tray laden with cakes and tea, and she'd be like, yeah, it's 11 days, let's have a break. And we'd have this lovely uh, reverie of, around uh, a cup of tea and some cakes. so English. The album that emerged from this process, The Hounds of Love, was a huge success, including the track Now Enjoying a Renaissance. When we hear Running Up That Hill, with the melody coming in this very strange, almost like subterranean, you know, sound that she's created to do that, which is from a synthesizer called a Fairlight synthesizer, which was very revolutionary at the time, very expensive. There weren't many of them around. More albums followed. The Sensual World in 1989, and in 1993, The Red Shoes, and then a break from recording and performing. For 12 years... What happens is she has a baby and she has time off. Jude Rogers. I think people are very quick to cast Kate as this, you know, artistic recluse who's just disappeared and into her own world. You know, what happened was she was had made the artist she was really happy with. She said in interviews, you know, she's always making music. She's just chosen to not release that music. In 2005, she released another album, Ariel. For her 2011 album, Director's Cut... Kate revisited older material, re-recording it with analogue technology. And if her return to recording albums was a surprise, what happened next was a bolt of lightning. When the concerts, the Before the Dawn residency was announced, it was like the music industry all took this huge collective intake of breath. Kate Bush coming back and playing live. Jude was there. I love that she looked like a woman in her 50s. She looked beautiful, wonderful, and her voice was so fantastic, but she had made no concessions to what the outside world might want of her as a performer of that age. She was doing what she wanted to do. The entire run of concerts sold out in hours. Wuthering Heights was back in the charts. Kate Bush became not only the first woman to have eight albums in the top 40 charts at once, but the only artist ever to achieve that apart from the Beatles and Elvis. The world seemed desperate for more Kate, but she went quiet again. In 2018, she published a book of song lyrics wittily titled How to Be Invisible. And then, in 2022, Netflix TV series Stranger Things featured the 1985 track Running Up That Hill. It's all about overcoming perceived fears and restrictions and finding yourself when you're in a very low down period and just finding that inner strength. This idea that men and women could swap around places and have a sort of insight into one another's perspectives and it just sort of summons something. It is about how music can connect us to our pasts, our memories, really crucial, emotional, important things in our lives. Every time we think Kate Bush has stopped, she's just preparing something new to surprise us with. She's just the greatest role model for all artists. She does what she wants and is constantly curious and searching, but makes sure she's happy and healthy at the same time. Just perfect. (laughs) 